It was one of the most painful, difficult days of my entire life. Even though it was almost 50 years ago, almost five decades ago, I can remember it vividly like it was yesterday. I mean, it was heartrending, it was painful, it was difficult. It was also, strangely, one of the best days of my life. When I look back at that day, it was a turning point that was transformational in helping making me the person God wanted me to be. It was long before I was a Christian, didn't grow up in a Christian home, but this, this day, and, and the, the moment that was the most painful moment was the exact same moment that was the best moment. Let me tell you what happened. I was in junior high. Uh, I was at a friend's house, and my dad called the house. I didn't have a phone because there weren't phones you carried around with you back then. I'm just dating myself here, but uh, the phones were connected to the wall with a wire. You couldn't walk away from the phone. If you ask your grandparents about it, they'll tell you all these stories of the olden days, right? But I, I was at a friend's house. They got a call. They said, oh, Kevin, it's your dad. That was never a good thing. When my dad called and I was out at someone else's house, they had to track me down and find me. But he, I went to the phone, and he said, come home immediately. You're in trouble. Okay, Dad, hang up the phone, headed home. So as I'm going home, I was playing the game in my mind, what did I get caught for? It could have been a dozen different things. Um, I was not a good kid. This is my BC, before Christ days, and so I'm going home. And I was hoping it wasn't the worst of the things that I knew I had done. I was hoping I hadn't gotten caught for the worst of the things. But when I got home, it was the worst of the things that I knew I'd been doing at that time that I got caught for. So my dad, before any other punishment or consequences, did what he always did. He took me to his room. We sat down together and we talked. Those talks were torturous. If you could have let me choose between being paddled and being talked to, I would take paddling all day long. But my dad said to me, Kevin, someone's been stealing money from your brother, Eric. Now, Eric wasn't my brother. He was a guy who lived in the room above our garage, and we had had always had people living with us. We had an extra room, and my parents always shared that space. And this guy had a job at a liquor store in the area. He he actually made money. I was a junior high kid. I didn't have any money. But he always left money laying around. And I decided I'd start taking some of that money. Hadn't spent any of it. Had tucked it away in my room somewhere. My parents hadn't found the money, but but Eric had told them someone was stealing from his room. And my parents, pretty much out of his five kids, knew who it was. So they called me. They said, have you been taking your brother's money? And I said, yes. He said, do you still have it? I said, yes. He said, go get it now. Went to my room, got the money, brought it back, gave it to my dad. And then my dad looked at me and he said, what is it called when a person takes what does not belong to them? And my dad waited. I had to say the word. I said, stealing. And he said, what do you call a person who steals from others? And he waited. And I said the word. I said, a thief. And I wrote it down, because this is exactly what my dad, who I love and respected as a kid and and still do to this day, he spoke these hard, painful, life-changing words. My dad looked at me and he said, You are a thief, and I will think of you as a thief, and I will treat you like a thief until you prove otherwise. And it almost killed me. I'd take 10 spankings over that. You are a thief, my dad said, and I will think of you as a thief, and I will treat you like a thief until you prove otherwise. Did my dad speak those words because he hated me? Because he wanted to hurt me? No. And just for the record, there were other consequences after the conversation. There always were. But the conversation was what came first. There are those moments when truth comes like a bucket of ice cold water that wakes you up, startles you, and cleanses your soul. That was one of those minutes for me, like a bucket of ice-cold water pouring over me. At that moment, I had to face the fact of who I was and who I had become. I was just a young kid. This is long before I became a Christian, long before I'd even heard the name of Jesus, except for as profanity. But of all the things I didn't want my dad to do was think of me like that. It was a painful moment, but it was one of the best moments of my life. Because I made a decision that I would do everything I had to do to change the way I was behaving and living and being to show my dad I am not that person who I've shown you that I am. 
And I thank God Almighty for a dad who loved me enough to not look the other way. To not say, oh, that's just kids. But to look at me and speak the clear, definitive truth. That is who you've become, and that's who you will be if you keep walking down that road. We're talking today about the courage to speak the truth, to do it in love, to do it as led by the Word of God and led by the Spirit of God, but to actually learn to speak the truth. And so we're going to be looking together uh, at God's Word at 1 Kings chapter 21. If you have your Bibles, I would really encourage you to open your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 21 because we're going to walk through this, this story in 1 Kings 21. I call this story, When Deceit Meets Truth-Telling. When Deceit Meets Truth-Telling. And we're going to see six scenes with six characters and six lessons. Each scene has a primary character, and each character kind of gives us a lesson for our lives about learning to have the courage to speak the truth. And let me be very clear as we talk about truth speaking, that we also have to talk about truth hearing. There's two pieces to this equation. Here's piece one. And, and I want you just to pause and pray right now as I'm sharing this. Pray for yourself. Here's part one. Will I have the courage to speak the truth to somebody else? Because I love them too much to ignore it and look the other way. If you keep drinking the way you're drinking, you will destroy your health, your marriage, your family, and everything you love. You could lose it all. I love you too much to not say anything. If you keep treating that person the way you're treating them, that friendship will blow up and end because you are not kind. If you keep speaking words with that kind of harshness and, and razor-sharp you know, verbiage and words, you will destroy your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, your friends. Will I dare, when God leads me by his word and by his spirit, will I dare to speak the truth to someone else when God is calling me to do so? And it's hard for us to do. I bet you almost every person here has one person in your life that you've been wanting to speak the truth to, but you're terrified. You don't know how they'll respond, what will happen, so you just don't say anything. So here's the first prayer. Oh, Lord, give me the courage to speak the truth when you're leading, to do it with kindness and love, but clarity and confidence. Help me be a truth speaker. Give me the courage. Can you pray that prayer? Now, here's the second prayer, and this one's really challenging. This is to say, oh, God, when there's a person in my life who loves me enough to speak the truth to me, who gets past that fear and trepidation of actually looking at me and sharing something that's a concern that they have, Lord, you give me the courage to hear the truth and receive the truth. Yeah, but what if they're only half right? Lord, may I listen. I can sort out which part was accurate or not later, but right now, Lord, help me listen to someone who dares to have the courage to love me enough to speak the truth. It's a hard thing to do. It's easier if the person listening will receive those words. Lord Jesus, that's our prayer today. If we leave here today, having learned from Elijah and his story, if we've learned to have a greater confidence to speak the truth in love, guided by you, and to hear the truth when spoken by those who love us, Lord, change our lives. I pray for each one of us, there'll be a point where we can say, this difficult, painful day where someone spoke the truth became one of the best days in my life because I'm a different person, because they love me enough to speak the truth. Lord, change our hearts as we look at your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Kings chapter 21. Scene 1, character 1, Naboth. This is 1 Kings 21, 1 through 3. And I call this scene a portrait of integrity. Naboth is a portrait of integrity. Look with me at 1 Kings chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. We met Ahab last week in the battle that Elijah had against the, the false prophets, Ahab and his wife Jezebel. We're going to meet them again and get to know more about them in this passage today. But his house happened to be close to the palace of the king of Samaria. Oh, that'd be cool to have your house right next to the king's house. Not so much. Verse 2. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or 
if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. So the king comes and says, I'd really like your vineyard. Now, in the ancient world, you have to understand, in the ancient world, saying no to the king was a pretty dangerous thing, even to a kind king. But what you have to understand about Naboth's vineyard is it's not just a piece of property. It's not just a a place that you could put a garden or a vineyard. It's his family inheritance. We can't understand this in our culture today because land means something different back then than it means now. It means that generation after generation after generation, it had been, it, it, it was his family's roots. It was their history. It was their home. And it would be that which he would pass on to his children and their children after them. It's a bigger deal than just, can I get a piece of land? And so look with me at how he responds in verse 3. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He said, I can't do it. I can't do it. That's a portrait of integrity. My family means more than bowing to you. So he speaks the truth. This is my family inheritance. The Lord forbid. I I would be like sinning against God. I can't do that. All right, so that's scene one. Scene two, character two, Ahab. And this is 1 Kings 21, 4 through 6. I call this scene a picture of self-centered immaturity. I'll give you a little hint in advance. I don't think anybody ever spoke the truth to Ahab his whole life. He was either the king or was going to be the king. He was the king or the prince. So everybody, I think, told him whatever he wanted to hear and never got in his way. You'll think so, too, when you see how he responded to just one person telling him, you can't have whatever you want, all right? So look with me now at verse 4. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. This guy said, I can't give you my inheritance And now the king is sullen and angry. Listen to this. He lay on his bed sulking, and he refused to eat. Just pause there for a minute. Everybody look at me. Hey, I didn't get my way. This is a grown adult. This is a king. He's acting like a selfish little child because somebody dared to say to him, you can't have whatever you want. So you're starting to get the feeling and the tone of Ahab. So we continue on in verse 5. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? She doesn't know what's happened, but she can see it written all over his face. He's wearing it externally. He's a big pouting child. Why won't you eat? He answered her, because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in this place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. That's why I'm pouting. So I'm acting like a child. I didn't get my way. Can I tell you, when you don't let anyone speak the truth to you, when you can make all your own decisions with nobody else speaking into your life, you will become a very self-centered child. It's when people speak the truth to us and we hear it that we change. I don't know who I would be today if my dad had not, I'm not just talking about that one day in junior high, dozens and dozens and dozens of times sat with me in his bedroom and spoken the truth. I remember times when my dad said, I will not let you become that kind of person, the person you're becoming. I will do all I can to help you not be that kind of person. And Ahab, I don't know if he had anyone love him ever love him enough to actually speak the truth. But he behaves like a child. He's upset. He's angry. And his wife then, then so, so, so that, that ends, uh, well, let, me, let me continue on. Verse, uh, verse 6. He answered her because I said, oh, I read the whole thing, but he said, I will not give you my vineyard. So pick up at verse seven. Now, this is the next scene. All right, scene number three. Now, scene number three, uh, the character is Jezebel. And this is verses seven, 21, seven through 16. And I call this scene a life of raw evil. Jezebel was raw evil. In the Old Testament days and even beyond that, people refer to, to somebody being a Jezebel. It's not a compliment. If you got named Jezebel, it's a beautiful name for you, okay? I'm just saying online, if you have the name Jezebel, wonderful. But this woman was not a good woman, and that name kind of became impacted by the way she behaved. So look with me at verse 7, and we continue into scene 3. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up, eat, cheer up. Pause right there for a minute. Now, you would think that she's saying to him, Is this how you act? Don't act like a child. Grow up. You can get another vineyard. 
But that's not what she's saying. She's saying, is this how you act? You're the king. Take what you want. Be more brutal. Be more heartless. She's not upset that he's acting immature. She's, a, 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 she's upset that he's not taking whatever he wants and acting like a tyrant. So look, look at how she interacts with him. He says, this how you act as king over Israel? Get up, eat, cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Ahab knew his wife. I think he knew once she was upset, she would do whatever it took to get him what he wanted. So look at verse 8. She wrote letters to, in Ahab's name as if she were the king, placed his seal on them, which made them authoritative, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, so here's what she sends in this letter, proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people and seat two scoundrels opposite him. And have them bring charges, lies, false charges, that he has cursed both God and the king. And then take him out and stone him to death. That's what she writes. You can keep reading on, but that's exactly what happened. They did what they were told. They thought it was by the king, Ahab. It was by Jezebel. But they did exactly what they were told. So now continue down in verse 15. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, no remorse. She said to Ahab, Get up, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell you. He is no longer alive, but dead. Ahab doesn't say, Oh, what happened to him? Was there an accident? Ahab knows what happened. All right? But when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. So here's Jezebel, and just evil to the core. Get whatever she wanted. She was the one that was feeding the false prophets. She was the one that was destroying and killing the two prophets in the land. And, and, and so now you start to see some of the consequences. Of, you know, for, 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 for Naboth, all he did was try to guard his family's inheritance. Now he's dead, and now Ahab owns his vineyard. So Ahab gets his way through the work of his wife. But the story's not over. Scene four, character four, is Yahweh, the Lord God. And I call this scene a vision of holy, piercing, unrelenting truth. God, God speaks with holy, piercing, unrelenting truth. 1 Kings 21, 17 to 20. We'll pick it up in verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. So now Elijah's in the scene, but this is the word of the Lord. It's God speaking. Now, he's speaking through Elijah, and Elijah knows Ahab, and Elijah finds out that what Ahab has done and God says to, to Elijah, now you go speak the truth to Ahab. Would you be a little nervous going to speak the truth to Ahab? I mean, if you're, if you're thinking about speaking the truth to someone, think about this story. God says, Elijah, I want you to go and speak to Ahab. Verse 18, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, so this is God's message, this is God's piercing truth to Ahab. He says, Elijah, I want you to say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? You say to him, so he says, Elijah, you say to Ahab, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. You say, oh, I brought my kids to church today. That's a little gory, right? You say, Wait, I, I, want, I, want, I want happy sermons. I want, like, I want little clouds and butterflies and rainbows and little hearts floating around. I want that, you know, I want that kind of sermon. But when you open up this book, you, you deal with some hard truth. And God says, in my piercing righteousness and my piercing truth, I will deal with the sin of Ahab. You know what's interesting, though? If you read the whole chapter, Ahab actually repents. He repents before God in sackcloth and ashes. And God actually says, I'm going to withhold my judgment. You say, well, if I was God, I wouldn't withhold my judgment for stuff like that. I'm glad that God is God and not me or you. <laughs> because through Jesus Christ, he withheld his judgment for me, for my sins. And I deserve to be judged for my sins. Jesus took my sins. If you read the whole thing, you find out that God says, this is the judgment. If he's basically, God's saying, basically, Ahab, if you stay on this path, you keep living like this, it's going to cost you your life. And Ahab repented, and God showed grace. That's amazing grace. All through the Bible, we see that theme. 
But right here, Elijah's told, go in the name of the Lord and speak the truth, a vision of holy, piercing, unrelenting truth. We need to hear the truth. One of the reasons that I over and over and over again challenge you as God's people or as people who are searching to know what it means to be a Christian, trying to figure out the whole Christian faith, one of the reasons I challenge you to read this book every single day is because this book doesn't change. This book is the truth. And it speaks truth into our hearts and our lives. God gives this unchanging, piercing, unrelenting truth in a world that keeps changing. You know, our, our world basically says, well, if we vote on something and say it's okay, then it's okay. Not if God says it's not okay. Well, but we took a vote. God didn't ask for our vote. Things are right because God says they're right. Things are wrong because God says they're wrong. In culture, things become right and wrong based on votes and politics and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't change what God says is true. One of the reasons I continually challenge you and that every single week we prepare a Bible reading guide and put it online and on the Shoreline app for you to have something to read in the Bible that will be getting you ready for the next Sunday sermon. One of the reasons we do that every single work year, week year round is because if you read this book, it will transform your life. Like my dad sat me down and spoke the truth to me and it changed me. God wants Yahweh God Almighty, the Lord God wants to do that for you. So when you open this book, and it points out something in your heart or your life that is not right. You don't change the book to fit your life. You don't change the book because your kids or grandkids are living outside of God's will. So I guess I don't believe the Bible says that anymore. You don't change the book to accommodate you. We change us to accommodate the book. Because these are the words of Yahweh, God Almighty. And he knows the best way to live. And when God speaks the truth to us, it's just like my dad sitting in his bedroom almost 50 years ago. My dad did not speak those words to hurt me. He spoke those words because he loves me. And he dared to speak the truth. And our God in heaven, our heavenly father, speaks truth to us in his word because he loves us. He doesn't want us to self-destruct, to blow up our lives. And so his word is true and his word leads and guides us. Scene five. Scene five, character five, is Elijah. Now, Elijah's already been speaking, but these are kind of the words of Yahweh. He's, he's fulfilling what God called him to speak. But I call this an example of speaking the truth at great risk. The fact that Elijah was going to Ahab and challenging him about murdering someone, he's telling him, you shouldn't have murdered that guy, which he understands, he's, very, he's fine murdering people. So Elijah's gonna go and speak the truth to him. This takes courage, courageous faith. And so... We pick, we pick the story up in chapter 21, verse 20. And listen to how Ahab, when he sees Elijah, how he greets him. Ahab said to Elijah, so you have found me, my enemy. Ahab says, you found me, my enemy. I got to believe that Elijah's thinking, you might see me as an enemy. You might want to kill me. But I'm not coming to you as an enemy. I'm coming to you as the best friend you have. Because they have nobody dares to speak the truth to you. And if you keep living the way you're living, the dogs will lick up your blood right where they licked up Naboth's blood. Do you know that when someone comes to you, when someone loves you enough to muster up the courage, kindly, prayerfully, but clearly saying, I'm concerned about the choices you're making, about the way you're living, about the way you're speaking, about the path that you're on. When someone dares to come to you with the courage to say that, it's not because they're your enemy. If they were your enemy, they'd let you keep running toward the cliff, right? Why are they coming to you? Why are they daring to incur your wrath or your hurt or your bitterness because you spoke to them? They, they're doing it because they love you. And so, so Ahab says, says to Elijah, so you have found me my enemy. But Elijah was not his enemy, and God is not our enemy. Elijah was speaking the truth because he wanted to speak on, the, on behalf of God and call him to change. So we continue on. In the rest of verse 20, Elijah says to him, I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Elijah says, you have sold yourself like a slave into evil. And then he goes on to say, just like the first king of the northern, of the northern kingdom, just like Jeroboam did, he, he goes to two different kings who were not good examples of kings, but who were evil kings. And he says, you're turning out just like them. And he's saying, stop, you're running towards the cliff. It's your one, it's just like, this is like your last chance to hear somebody speak the truth to you. And you can turn around and kill me, or you can hear these words. Ahab heard the words and repented. 
I was talking with somebody between services, and they said, man, if I was God, I wouldn't have forgiven him after all he did. And I said, you know, I wouldn't have either. It's good that we're not God. <laughs> because God is a God of grace, and when we repent, and every one of us would be condemned. Every one of us would be condemned if our sins were held over our head. And, and, and so, so Elijah speaks the truth to him at great risk. And then scene number six. Scene number six is every day from that point on, and the character is you and me. What story will you write with your life? What story will I write with my life? Will we have the courage to speak the truth to people that we love? When we see that they're heading towards a cliff, when we see that they're in behaviors or attitudes or patterns that are destroying them and destroying others? Or will we pull back and just be quiet? You know, one of the worst things we can ever do to someone we say that we love, one of the worst things we can ever do is to ignore their bad behavior and the things they're doing that are destructive. And then when their life blows up, we say to other people, oh, yeah, I saw that coming. I could have told that was going to happen. Yeah, I knew he was fooling around on his wife. I knew that. I've known that. For, everyone's known that for years. And you never went and said anything? You never loved them enough to speak the truth? No, no, you, we just stand back and kind of went, oh, yeah, I, I see what's going on. I'm just not going to say anything. It takes huge courage for you and I to love people enough to speak the truth. And it takes equally huge courage to look at somebody else when they, when they dare to come to us and speak the truth, to look at them and say, thank you for daring to share that with me. Thank you. I will really pray about that and think about that and search my heart and see if that's true. Now, if somebody comes to you and unloads something and it's not something that's for you and it's, not, it's just their own issue, you can listen and then God can show you that's not for you. But I find that almost every time somebody loves me enough to do this, there's some part of it that belongs to me. Usually like about 80 to 95%. <laughs> and I wouldn't be the person I am today if people hadn't loved me enough to do that. So let me ask you to do something. I want you just to think right now about one person in your life that you love and that you care about. And has God been showing you something or have you been seeing something and a, a pattern, a behavior, an attitude, a practice, a motive that you just know is destructive and damaging? And maybe you've even noticed it and you've thought to yourself, I should say something. Would you dare to pray to God today and say, Lord, is, is this for me to speak? Is this for me to love this person enough to say something? And can I say something real personal? If God would put something on your heart for me as your pastor, I would want to hear it. I would want you to love me as much as my dad loves me or loved me. He just passed away a few months ago. I want you to love me enough to say, Pastor, I'm concerned about something. Because I don't look at my life and say, I'm a perfect work by any means. The people who love me the most and are closest to me, starting with my wife and going to others, they know they know my imperfections. They know that my tongue can be so sharp and so unkind at times and I have to bite it or try to bite it off because I just go to the wrong places. They, God knows I'm, I'm not standing up here and pointing a finger at other people or wagging a finger at anybody as much as at myself. But I want people to love me enough to speak the truth and I want God to give me the humility to listen to that truth when someone dares to come and bring it. And again, if somebody comes with the wrong spirit, even if they have the wrong spirit but it's true, Listen. And if they come with the wrong spirit and it's not true, then pray about it. And if you don't feel like that's accurate, then move on. That's okay. But you've listened and you've heard. You will become a better person. I, I don't know how many times I sat with my dad in his bedroom and had talks about things in my life. But I look back now and those moments formed me. And they shaped me. I would not be the person I am today had I not heard those words. And at the moment, I wasn't very thankful for them. Not when I was 11, but I am now. And so let's do this. Let's just take a moment to think about some lessons we can learn from these different characters, from this simple story. And, and some, some of you are probably thinking, man, I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard a sermon about Naboth's vineyard and Elijah. But this is real life stuff. So here's some lessons we can take with us today. Lesson, lessons in truth telling. Lesson number one. Speaking the truth and living with integrity can be costly. Naboth spoke the truth. Naboth lived with integrity. It cost him. It cost him his own life. 
Hopefully it won't cost us nearly that much, but it costs something every time you speak the truth. Like I said, when my dad sat me down and had these talks with me as a kid, I was never thankful at the moment. I never said, Dad, you're so wise. I really appreciate you having the integrity and taking the time to speak the truth to me. Never once. I was angry. I was a child. But it was the right thing to do. And he was willing to incur my displeasure toward him. A parent who cannot handle their kid being upset with them occasionally shouldn't be a parent or should learn to be a better parent. Because there's going to be times if you're a good parent, your kids will not always agree with your decisions. But you love them and you lead them with that kind of love. And one day, hopefully, they will look back and see how much you love them and what you did, even in the tough moments. Lesson in truth-telling number two. When no one speaks the truth to you, bad habits lead to corrupt character. This is a lesson from Ahab. When no one speaks the truth to you. Jezebel didn't say, Ahab, grow up. It's a garden. Find another one. She said, you deserve everything you want, and I'm going to go kill someone to make sure you get what you want. If we don't love people enough to speak the truth, we don't help them, we harm them. And if no one speaks the truth to you, bad habits will transform who you are into a person that's not who you want to be. Lesson number three, a deceitful and lie-filled life costs you and everyone around you. If you live a deceitful life and a lie-filled life, it will not only cost you, it will cost every single person in your circle of influence. Oh, nobody will ever know. People always find out. Well, it's just, it, just, it, it just has to do with me. It won't affect my kids. It won't affect my coworkers. Oh, yes, it will. The repercussions of our choices affect all kinds of people around us. If you're not sure that's true, just, just take a moment and look at the news where one person crashes, makes a bad choice, a bad decision. Families crumble. Ministry, church ministries crumble. Businesses fall apart. Oh, it's just me. It's just my personal life. Never. And, and so if we don't take these things seriously, it will cost us, but it will also cost the people we love the most. Deceitful and life-filled lives, life costs you and everyone around you. Jezebel showed that. Everyone around her felt the collateral damage of her poor choices. Lesson of truth-telling number four. God's word is always true, and we need to hear it. We need to hear Yahweh, the Lord God, speak to us. We need to open this book. We need to grapple with it. And when we read this book, and something we read something that makes us uncomfortable or doesn't fit what we're doing, we commit to not try to manipulate the scriptures to fit what we want to do. We shape our lives to fit what God teaches. And that's a lifelong journey. Our, our journey of life is like this. Trying to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. We start sliding off the path and going over here. We read the word. Oh, no, that's not the right attitude. Go, we end up, oh, that's not the right action. And we keep realigning ourselves. This book, day by day, realigns who we are, where we're going, how we think. And it keeps us out of the, you know, out of the ruts and out of the ditches on the sides of the road and following Jesus. Let this book become such an important part of your life. And here at Shoreline, we've got children's programs where we teach the Bible, youth ministry where we teach the Word of God, women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies, couples' Bible studies, small groups. A lot of those have kind of slowed down in the season. Let's open them back up again. Let's start re-engaging. It's, it's time. Man, God has made us to be in community. He has made us to be in community. Let's keep taking steps forward as, as, as responsibly but as quickly as we can. Lesson number five. Speaking the truth is dangerous, but it honors God when he is leading. And Elijah is a great example. It was dangerous to go to Ahab and speak the truth, but it honored God, and it saved Ahab's life. And, and we've got to learn that we can honor God if we speak the truth, and we honor God when we hear the truth from people who love us, from family members, from God himself as he speaks through his word. And so commit yourself to hear God's word and speaking the truth is dangerous, but it honors God. Now listen to this, when he is leading. So be careful that you're not walking around all the time having to speak the truth to everyone. Hey, nice to see you. You know, th those shoes don't really go with those pants. That looks really tacky. Uh, just got to speak the truth. Jesus is leading me. I doubt it. If you think you're everyone's fashion consultant, I don't think that Yahweh's in the business of that so much. Everybody following me? When you think, if you're a person who you are a truth, you know, kind of censor, and you walk around all day long pointing out what's wrong with everybody else and speaking the truth from God, but somebody speaks the truth to you and you get defensive, I don't know how much you're walking in the Holy Spirit. 
There should be humility and a broken heart when you have to speak the truth. Not, I'm glad to bring you down a peg. But Lord, I humbly will follow what you're calling me to do. So be sure that you're not just walking around. You don't feel compelled to always speak your truth to everybody because your truth may not be very accurate. But you make sure that you're speaking God's truth when he leads to the people he calls you to. You don't have to be everybody's truth indicator, but you do need to respond when the Holy Spirit calls you. So be prepared and have courage, a courageous heart and then have the courage. And, here, and here's one of the most dangerous things. If you start speaking the truth to people, they will think they can do the same to you. Are you following me? Because they should be able to. And listen closely. You want that. You do. Mostly. You mostly want it. There's some moments you don't really want to always hear the truth. But in your heart of hearts, you do. You want to have that kind of relationship. And then number six, lesson in truth telling number six. I can grow in knowing, believing, receiving, and expressing the truth. Our lives can change. We can be transformed. My dad sitting me down and saying to me, Kevin, you know, you stole. What's that? Well, you took something. What's that called? Stealing. What do you call a person who steals? A thief. You are a thief. And I will think of you as a thief and I will treat you like a thief until you prove otherwise. I did all I could as a young kid to show my dad that's not who I am. And I do all I can to show my father in heaven that I'm becoming who he wants me to be. And I'm not totally there yet. And neither are you. So let's love each other enough to follow God's leading and speak the truth with kindness, with grace, but with strength. Let's have the humility to hear the truth and let God speak to us through other people. And let's all make sure that we're in this book letting Yahweh, the Lord God, speak truth to us and following this, aligning our lives with his word. And watch what he does in you and watch what he does through you. Lord God, this is our prayer today. In this world that seems to think that truth is based on a vote or on consensus or on a poll. And God, you are the truth and you establish truth. So Lord, our prayer today is very simple, but it's very deep and challenging. Lord, our first prayer is this. God, if you are leading us to speak the truth, if it's your spirit leading us, and we're doing it with a humble heart, but in the confidence of your spirit, Teach us to speak the truth to people we love. If they're running towards a cliff, if they're heading towards danger, let us love them enough to speak the truth for your glory. And then, Lord, our second prayer is this. Prepare our hearts that we would hear you speaking truth through Scripture and we would follow it. We would hear you speaking through the people in our life who love us enough to speak into our lives. Lord, it's a scary thought but we want to become more like you. And it's going to take allowing people to come to us and speak the truth and do it in love. Give us deep, courageous faith that transforms us into who you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. I want to give you a couple invitations that I'm going to send you off with a word of blessing. And the first one, and this hit me the first service. It just felt like God put it on my heart. It's going to be really easy to leave here today to, to, close, you know, to, to turn off the TV or your computer or your phone or to leave the parking lot here and God put someone on your heart that you need to speak the truth to or maybe God started speaking the truth to your heart that you need to hear. It's going to be really easy to leave and just kind of go, okay, what's, uh, what's next week's topic about and kind of move on. Don't do that. Don't do that. Linger here and follow through if God's put someone on your heart and be ready to receive if someone comes to speak with you. And let God transform you through that. This Wednesday night, once a month, we have the best Wednesday of the month. It's called Night of Worship. I love Nights of Worship. We'll be right here in the courtyard. I want to give a special invitation to our folks online at home. I want to invite you, if you're ready, if this is going to be your next step. I'm, I don't have to say it to all of you here because you're ready. You're here in the courtyard. And you're, or you're here in your cars. Would you pray about coming in your car to Night of Worship or coming on campus? I'm, I want to see us just taking steps when you're ready, but I want to challenge you to be, as soon as you're ready, step in. Don't stay at home because of convenience. Begin to re-engage as we're being together here. And we're going to be together this Wednesday night, 6.15 to 7.30, to have communion, to worship together, to open God's word together. We're doing this series on the names of God and what's in the name, and we're talking about God as our good shepherd. It's going to be an amazing sermon, an amazing evening together, and a great time breaking the bread and sharing communion at home Make sure you have some crackers and juice or bread and wine, whatever you want to use. Get it ready for communion. We'll provide for people in the cars. We'll provide you in the courtyard with the elements for communion. And we're going to have a great night of worship. So I invite you to come be part of that. If you're going to be in the courtyard, get online and register. If you're going to be coming back for the first time, get online and register. 
and we'll see you here Wednesday night. If you need prayer for anything, I see Pastor Dennis up there at the top of the stairs and his team, and so you see the big sign, need prayer, go right up there for prayer. If you're in the courtyard or in your car, let them pray for you. If you're at home, you can email at the, at the address there, email your prayer need, and we'll not only pray for you now, we'll share it with our prayer team, or you can call the number there, and there's somebody waiting live to just talk with you and pray with you right now. We'd love to pray with you uh, online, online that way, and so check in with us there. And if you're new at Shoreline, if this is your first time here, if you've never done this before, if you've never gone to the Connection Center, they got a little gift waiting for you, a warm welcome. They want to answer your questions. So right there where the blue, white, and silver balloons are in the back there, just head back there. And, uh, and, and check into that. And also, we have our Spanish-speaking ministry. If you know people that are Spanish speakers that want to be part of Shoreline, let them know we do, still do translation. We have a team here, so we're doing Spanish translation. I think we have Spanish online, too. And so uh, thank you to our, to our Spanish-speaking team. Uh, and and if, you're, if you are at home and you're new, uh, just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen right now. And we will follow up with you as, as personally as we can online. But we want to reach out to you and get to know you better. Hey, if you're able to stand at home, uh, we've got lots of tailgaters outside their cars here. So if you're able to stand, stand with us and let me send you off with a word of blessing. All right. As you go from this place, as you drive out in your cars from our drive-in folks, as you go from home and finish your time with us together, as you leave the courtyard here, may you walk with, with courage and strength. May you have the courage of the spirit of the living God, that if God is leading you to do it, to speak the truth with humility, with love, with strength. Speak the truth and have the courage to receive what others dare to come to you and help you see that there's areas you can grow to. And may we all become more and more like Jesus. Amen? God bless you. Have the next couple of days, and we'll see you Wednesday night, 6.15, right here or online. God bless you. Have a great day.